the nice turnout. I see a room full of remarkable women and men. <laughs> it's all good. Um, I'm going to start by acknowledging the land, traditions, and culture of four nations following the Columbia River to the north, the Sequipnik, to the east through the Selkirk Mountains, the Tanaha, following the Columbia River south, the Snakes, to the west through the Monashi Mountains, the Silk. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and culture. And I'm starting today because I, I can. I'm starting with some of my own remarkable women. These were my uh, mother uh, in the white, Eileen, and my grandmother, Helen, and mom's four sisters, Marguerite, Francie, Pat, and Doreen. And they also had five brothers for a match set of ten kids. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, of course, they, as, as, as all women do, they all had their own stories. But she looks like her. I'm going to start with um, a couple of women that we don't really think of when we think of Revelstoke history, but they were certainly part of, of this region and they made significant contributions. I'm going to start with three women, all named Mary, all from the United States. Uh, the first one is Mary Vox, or Mary Vaux, uh, different pronunciations. She was born in Philadelphia to a Quaker family in 1860 uh, with her brothers, William and George. They first visited Glacier House in Rogers Pass in 1887, and they photographed the Illisoluit Glacier. They returned in 1894, and they were startled by the recession of the glacier at that, in that uh, small period of time. So they began formal studies and scientific reports on the glacier's movements. And they continued that through, uh, through the decades, up until quite recently. And uh, so the, that whole family together uh, provided some of the first glacial studies in North America. Um, Mary Vox was, uh, in order to do the work, she was climbing. And as you can see, she was wearing a uh, long skirt uh, as the women of, of the day did. This would have been probably about 1901. So she was um, performing a lot of the same climbs that the men were doing it, but encumbered by long skirts and um, not positive whether she wore a corset, but um, certainly the, the long skirts. Um, she actually was the first woman to reach the summit of Mount Stephen yeah, near Field. Uh, she was also a skilled photographer, painter, and botanist. She wrote and illustrated North American Wildflowers in 1925, mm. published by the Smithsonian Institute as a five-volume work. She was elected the president of the Society of Women Geographers in 1933. Um, she was married uh, uh, in, her in her 50s uh, to a man named uh, Walcott, and uh, her father, who she'd been taking care of up till that time, strongly objected to her getting married. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, she died in 1940 at the age of 80. Uh, last uh, year, there was um, a film uh, produced about Mary Vox by Agathe Bernard, um, another local remarkable woman who we're working with now to do uh, a film project on the, the uh, valley south of Revelstoke. Uh, but it's available online if you Google carving landscapes. It's a, Lovely little story about uh, Mary Vox and uh, some of her exploits. One of the other Marys was Mary Schaefer War Warren. She was also born in uh, Philadelphia, also to a Quaker family in 1861. Uh, she made a trip to the Canadian Rockies and Selkirks in 1889, visiting Banff, Lake Louise, and Glacier House. Um, she met uh, Dr. Charles Schaefer who was a medical doctor and member of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. They were married in 1890. Um, she uh, returned to uh, Canada for botanical studies and she learned to draw the specimens in scientific detail. She dried and pressed specimens, reproduced them in detailed watercolors, and developed a technique for photographing them to complete the scientific record. She was elected a member of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia in 1896. She was also a member of the Geographical Society of America. She did a lot of, <clears throat> of climbing in this area as well. <clears throat> Her husband died in 1902, and she returned to Canada to finish the work that they had uh, started together. 
and spent most of the rest of her life in Canada. She was at Glacier House in 1903 when uh, Sir James Hector was traveling across the country talking about his exploits in the 1850s and 1860s as part of the Palliser expedition and their exploration of what became the Kicking Horse Pass. And he was the <coughs> one that was kicked by the horse. Um, while they were there, her uh, Douglas's 26-year-old son, who was, uh, uh, sorry, James Hector's 26-year-old son, Douglas, uh, became ill and died in Revelstoke of appendicitis. And Mary Schaefer was um, one of the people who was uh, made, made a point of being at the graveside in Revelstoke and supporting James Hector during that time. In 1911, she published a book called Old Indian Trails in the Canadian Rockies. We have a reprint of it in our uh, collection. I have a copy of it on the table here. Um, she, uh, when she was uh, climbing, she always made it a point to make sure she had female companions with her just for the sake of propriety. Uh, so she was not traveling alone with male guides. But in 1915, she married one of her male guides, uh, <laughs> Billy Warren, uh, who lived in Banff, and she remained there for the rest of uh, her life. Um, in 1911, she was uh, she asked to survey Malign Lake for the Geological Survey of Canada. So she did a lot of uh, both botanical and geographical geological work in the area. She died in Banff in 1939 at the age of 78. Mm. Here's another Mary. This is Mary Job Akeley, born in Ohio in 1878. She graduated with a Bachelor of Arts of Philo in Philosophy in 1897 and received her master's degree in English and American History from Columbia University in 1909. She first came to Revelstoke in July of 1905 with a botanical party from a, a college in Philadelphia to collect plant specimens. They were camping on the Big Bend Road north of Revelstoke and they uh, spent some time in Groundhog Basin, and they actually walked to their camp from Revelstoke into the Groundhog Basin. Mm -hmm. uh, she was working under the direction of a man named Dr. Charles H. Shaw. While they were doing their botanical work, Mary found and identified a new variety of the spleenwort fern. Well, on her 1905 trip, she made a 10-day trip into the Selkirks from the Big Bend. Uh, there's a, a said that she uh, found uh, Shaw's, her, uh, the head of their group, found his belief in the ability and efficiency of women as explorers greatly encouraging. He felt that it was only a matter of time before women would equal men in such pursuits. <laughs> she also spent time at Glacier House and at Banff. She came back to the Selkirks in 1909 to join an expedition to the headwaters of the Gold River. Um, she was uh, un working uh, with uh, Dr. Herschel, uh, Herschel Parker and um, Howard Palmer, who were heading the expedition for the Dominion Topographical Survey. And uh, as a result of some of that survey work, Har uh, Palmer produced a 1915 reconnaissance map of the Big Bend, which we have on display and in our gift shop as well. Um, she climbed uh, Mount Sir Sanford in, uh, in 1909 as well, so she was doing a lot of climbing. She did other climbs in the Selkirks and near Mount Robson, and there is a Mount Job near Mount Robson which is named for her. In 1924, she married Carl Akeley, who was an explorer, scientist, sculptor, and taxidermist. He was the African specialist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City which is the museum that they used for the first Night at the Museum movie. Uh -huh. um, they were uh, collecting and exploring in Africa on behalf of the museum. Carl died of a tropical disease in the Belgian Congo, and uh, Mary succeeded uh, Carl as advisor in the development of the African Hall of the museum, later renamed the Akeley African Hall. So if you've ever seen the Night at the Museum movie, where all the animals, they, uh, the, the lions are, that's the Akeley Hall of the, um, the, the American Museum of Natural History. In September of 1937, Mary Job Akeley returned to this area, and this is a picture of her at that time, in company with uh, Miss Shella Dickey, the sister of Earl Dickey, the local photographer. Uh, she made a trip to the Big Bend, up the Big Bend Highway, as far as Goldstream, camping overnight at Downey Creek. 
at uh, the newspaper note said that she redis rediscovered several points of interest, which she first visited well over 30 years ago when she made the trip on foot and with pack horse. Mrs. Akeley, Miss Dickey, George Merkel, and Earl Dickey left for Donald from where they traveled by auto to both encampment, Canoe River, and other places on the East Lake of the Big Bend Highway. So this was her in 1937 when she was exploring by car some of the, the terrain that she'd traveled earlier in her life. She died in 1966 at the age of 87. Uh, the next woman I wanted to talk about, I don't have any slides of. Her name was Adeline, and she was the wife of Jim, who's often referred to as Culpus Jim. Uh, Culpus Jim was shot by a settler named Sam Hill at Galena Bay in 1894. Adeline was with Jim at the time that he was shot. She gave testimony, testimony at Sam Hill's trial, and throughout the, the newspaper articles about uh, the trial, she is referred to as the squaw. Um, the uh, translation wasn't really that great. It wasn't their, her dialect that the translator was uh, familiar with, so he wasn't able to really accurately give her testimony. And what testimony that she did give was discounted. Based on her testimony, Sam Hill should have been uh, found guilty, but instead he was, he was acquitted. Um, Adeline lived to be about 100 years old, and she has living descendants in the Sinaix Nation of the Colville Confederated Tribes in the United States. This is uh, Catherine and Fred Fraser. They were married at Moose Jaw, which was then part of the Northwest Territories, on January 1st, 1884. Uh, Fred continued on with railway construction to Revelstoke, and um, Catherine joined him in 1885. Now there's conflicting stories because uh, kind of the local legend was that she was referred to as the first decent white woman in Revelstoke. <laughs> and uh, there, there definitely were indigenous women living here uh, still at that time. There were definitely um, prostitutes living in Revelstoke at that time. But um, I, I'm not sure that her claim to be the first sort of family woman is correct. Uh, from other newspaper accounts that I found, there definitely were families living here early in 1885. And it also said that uh, the family story says that she came to Revelstoke on the first work train through here in May of 1885. And that one we can discount because the tracks weren't laid to Revelstoke until September, October of 1885. So however, if she did get here in May, she didn't come by train. <laughs> um, but definitely they were uh, a pioneer family. They settled in the uh, Big Eddy just across the, uh, across the railway bridge. You can, in early pictures of their farmhouse, you can see the railway bridge. So they were very close there. They uh, were uh, one of the very first fa farming families in Revelstoke. And uh, it would have been quite a feat to create farmland out of uh, what was pretty much forest at the time. They would have had a lot of work to do in terms of, of clearing the land. Carriage. And they raised uh, 10 children there as well. So, and of course we know that the raising of the children fell to the, to the women. One of the things that I found in a lot of my uh, early uh, work and research is that if you're looking at uh, accounts about uh, women involved in the community, uh, they'd be referred to by their husband's name. So she would be called Mrs. Fred Fraser. She would never be called Catherine Fraser in a news report. And even often in obituaries, they didn't give the woman's actual name. You have to go to the official record, the death certificate, to get the actual name of uh, the women. Uh, so, you know, when I've, so there, and there's been quite a few cases where um, you know, I'm looking up an obituary of somebody and it'll say Mrs. Fred Fraser, for example, and you have to go into the, into the vital events registry to find out her actual first name. Uh, that, was, that, was certain, that was very, very common. Um, so you know, women's uh, role wasn't always uh, acknowledged that much. I've seen even family histories where they 
they all they talk about is the man of the household and said that he raised ten children. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. and, uh, and of course, a lot of the women when they had farms, a lot of the women were doing the farm work as well. Because in most cases, the husbands had other jobs. Fred Fraser, um, after he he worked for the railway, but then he also had a lot of government jobs. He was government agent for several years and quite involved in in local politics. So she would have been left to uh, raise the children. She was a Catholic as well, and in a lot of the uh, church records, the baptismal records, her name is often on as a, a godmother. So she was a godmother to a lot of the, the Catholic children in town too. And before they had nurses and midwives, the, the women would help each other. So she's actually even li listed on some birth certificates as attending at births as well, even though she wasn't a, a trained midwife. This is uh, Farwell in 1885, and thanks to Holly's very sharp eyesight, we were able to determine that the sign on this white tent actually says red light. Oh. And, uh, we all know that red light refers to a brothel, and we do certainly know that there were brothels in, um, in early Farwell community, uh, or what became early Revelstoke, and of course Front Street was the, the original downtown of Revelstoke. Uh, we're, we don't know all of the names of the women. We don't know, you know, we certainly don't know their stories. Uh, there was uh, one particular woman who was, uh, her name was Agnes uh, West. Uh, there was another woman who was uh, Mother Foster, who was referred to as a, a, a big black woman. Um, her, she and her husband had come up to Canada from the States. They were working in railway construction and uh, her husband uh, was a barber and was attacked by a client and ended up being shot. So she ended up wow. here in Revelstoke and was uh, running a, a brothel for a while. She mm. ended up in Nelson where she became really well known as a midwife and nurse in the community of Nelson. Uh, there was another woman who's uh, Jenny Kiyabara, a woman from Japan who was murdered in uh, 1905 uh, uh, in one of the houses on Front Street. Uh, so there's lots of stories. Um, in the 1901 census, a lot of the women who we know were, were uh, prostitutes were giving their occupation as a housekeeper or musician or uh, waitress, and probably some of them did those, those things as well. Uh, a few women actually put their pro their occupation down as prostitute in the 1901 census. Mm -hmm. We also have a police record book going back to um, uh, to uh, 1901 and uh, or 1900, and it has uh, a lot of, of the people that were brought in on various offenses. Uh, the women who were brought in on prostitution were charged with. Uh, a whole variety of things, uh, anywhere from vagrancy to operating a house of ill repute to uh, being an inmate of a house of ill repute. Uh, sometimes they referred to that as, as a disorderly house. Um, so there was a lot of euphemisms for it as well. The women who were brought in uh, were, if they were an inmate or working for a madam or a, or a pimp, they were usually charged around $4, which was still a lot of money in 1900. The madams uh, or the operators of the homes were usually charged about $20. And some of these women were being brought in to, uh, on charges um, like every few months. Um, so you know, the, to, the city was actually making quite a bit of money uh, from charging these women and then letting them go. Occasionally, if a new woman came through into town, they would try to sort of stop them, put them on the next train out to avoid having too many, but they really didn't do anything to, to stop the prostitution that was going on at that time. So this is a picture of an inside of a, a brothel in Farwell in early 1900. It's quite a remarkable photograph. It's the only photograph we have of uh, any of the, the brothels. Uh, you can see it's beautifully decorated you can't tell from where you're sitting, but at least a couple of those uh, photograph paintings are nudes, which uh, you know, the ladies of society wouldn't have had on their walls in their living rooms, uh, but it was quite acceptable in the brothel. Uh, you can see there's also some musical instruments, beautiful chandelier, some uh, vases and statuary on the mantel, 
and the women are wearing very beautiful uh, dresses as well. So it's definitely part of the community for a long time. Do you know when the, when the last brothel closed? There was actually a bra uh, one brothel that I'm aware of that was operating until probably the 19, late 1940s. So even after the Second World War, there was still mm -hmm. at least one in operation. Mm -hmm. So it did continue for a long time. At the end of Douglas Street. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was one right at the end of Douglas Street. Um, do, here's another remarkable woman, and I've done a whole talk on her before. She uh, merits, she certainly merits a talk on her own. She's a really incredible person. Her name was Alice Jowett. Uh, this is her in the black. She's uh, probably be in her 40s or uh, 50s by this time. Um, she was born in England in 1854 and was married and either widowed or left her husband and came to Canada with three children in 1891. She worked in Vancouver for in bakeries and restaurants and then um, was quite fascinated by uh, tales of uh, the gold and silver and mining finds in the Lardo area. So she moved to Trout Lake with her children in 1897 and ran the Trout Lake Hotel and later purchased the Windsor Hotel, which is still standing in Trout Lake. She had several mining claims, including this one, which was the Foggy Day. And uh, she was probably one of the most successful miners in the Lardo. She would consistently uh, make uh, quite big finds and uh, reportedly sold one of her claims for over $10,000. So she did very well and was really an institution in the Lardo for many years. She was actually working uh, both in the hotel and still going into her mining claims when she was in her 90s. Uh, she finally uh, went to a uh, nursing home in Kelowna and died there in 1955 at the age of 101. Um, this is uh, the members of the, the Smythe family. And uh, this is about the baptism of Marjorie Smythe in 1898. Uh, they lived in a, the Smythe family lived in a little uh, house at the corner of uh, Mackenzie and First. And when that area was going to be developed for more of the downtown, the house was moved and it's still standing on Connaught Avenue. It's the little pink house just behind the RCU Insurance Building. And um, mm -hmm. the, there were several uh, Smythe brothers who were living in town. And this one is uh, Hugh Smythe. And he married uh, Amy uh, uh, Carolyn Gibbon. And uh, they had Marjorie. And this is, um, this is Hugh's mother, who would also come over from England. So there's quite a big extended family. Um, Hugh and uh, Carolyn and uh, their family moved to uh, farming property just about where the Chevron station is now and the junction of the Trans-Canada Highway. And they operated a farm there for quite a few years. Uh, they went on to have um, seven children. This is uh, Mrs. Smythe and uh, her uh, four, some of her daughters. Uh, they also had some sons as well, so a total of seven children. So this woman here is Marjorie, the oldest daughter whose baptism we saw in the earlier photograph. Um, she was uh, born in uh, 1897, and um, she uh, married Alan Victor Kelly, and they had ten children. Uh, eight of them served in the Second World War in various services, including um, uh, several of the daughters as well. Um, the one son died in the war, John, the oldest son, John Stanley. The family lived on an 80-acre homestead north of Revelstoke, which is uh, just on the road towards the Revelstoke Dam. And then uh, for a while in the 30s, they lived at 12 Mile, where Alan uh, Parker, uh, or Alan Kelly was the ferryman. Um, Marjorie later remarried uh, uh, Ke uh, Parker, so it was known locally as Marjorie Parker. Um, when uh, they were living at uh, 12 Mile, Marjorie convinced the school board to build a school at 12 Mile, as well as the families that were already there. Uh, they, the Kellys provided quite a few uh, children of their own to bring up the numbers for a school. Uh, they came back to the Big Bend in the, later in the 30s. Um, 
Marjorie uh, Parker, Kelly Parker, was quite a uh, accomplished uh, artist as well. We have quite a few of her paintings in our collection, and we have an oral history that uh, she gave in the, the 1970s. So uh, she's probably worthy of a story of her own as well. Uh, I like this photograph in part just because of the sleeves. <laughs> no, <laughs> look at the sleeves on those blouses. They're pretty outrageous. Yeah. Uh, but these women are Maya Dare, uh, Elizabeth Knowles Brown, Kathleen McLean, and Lida Edwards. And uh, they all have their own stories. Um, we talked quite a bit about Lida Edwards, who became Lida Holton. And uh, she was using, the, when their family came here, they were going by the name Edwards, but their family name was Silcott. And I've given a talk on them before, so I'll just make a long story short here. Um, Lida Silcott's uh, father had been a cashier in a bank in the United States and was accused of embezzling a huge amount of money. Uh, there's uh, whole theories about what actually happened, but he did flee the country. Uh, there's a story that he uh, originally went to Montreal with his uh, French Canadian mistress. But we believe that they ended up in Vancouver where he was going under the name Charles Edwards and they came to Revelstoke and he was involved in some of the hotels here and the family ended up settling here going under the name Edwards. Lida Selcott Edwards married Charles Holton who uh, was, uh, had made quite a bit of money in mining in the Lardo and was one of the original owners of the Enterprise Brewery. Um, he, in 1897 he married Lida Holton and they built their beautiful home at the top of First Street Hill which is still there and uh, operating as Holton House uh, Bed and Breakfast. Um, she was an interesting person just because you know, she came here uh, running away from a scandal and became very much high society in Revelstoke. Uh, at their home they hosted uh, benefits for the Anglican Church and for the Red Cross Society and Women's Canadian Club. Uh, she was a very skilled bridge player. Uh, in fact she sort of struck fear into the hearts of a lot of the other local bridge players. She was that good, uh, but really became sort of entrenched in, in Revelstoke society and certainly did a lot of good for the, the community as well. Uh, that's uh, in the sitting room of, of their home in uh, the early 1900s. And uh, it's hard to see, this photograph is, um, it probably, just probably just the way it was developed, but there's a dog up there. Yeah. And there's something that looks like it could be a baby under yeah, there, baby down there but it's very strange looking. So we've all sort of called this photograph the ghost baby photo. <laughs> uh, but certainly, as I say, she really became uh, very much uh, part of uh, Revelstoke High Society. Yeah. One of the uh, people in the family was uh, Mary Edwards, or also Mary Silcott. And Mary was the niece of Lida. They ended up... Um, the, the, the uh, Mary's uh, mother died, so they ended up uh, raising Mary. So uh, Lida and uh, and Charles ended up raising Mary. In uh, 1910, she married uh, Dr. G. H. Hamilton. There's an interesting story that I found about Mary. Um, when the family first came here, she uh, they had been living in Vancouver, and I guess she decided that she wanted to go back and visit some of the people that she knew in Vancouver. So at five years old, she got on the train here and went by herself to Vancouver. <laughs> there was a note in the newspaper saying, Little Mary Edwards, erstwhile the favorite of the manor house, came down from Revelstoke yesterday and is visiting in town. The plucky little five-year-old girl is ultra-modern and thought but little, apparently, of such a long journey alone. <laughs> and this was uh, her wedding day in 1910. Uh, the, her two bridesmaids are Pearl Robinson and Maud Hyatt, and they went all through school together, and if you look up the school records, uh, every year all three of those girls were the top students in their classes. So all uh, very intelligent young women. This is uh, Sarah and William Dickey, and uh, another unknown woman whose name we don't know but uh, it was possibly taken right here because this is uh, the, where the Dickey home was. Uh, Sarah 
uh, came here in uh, the 1880s to join her husband who was here and working for the railway. And uh, there's a story that her first morning in town, they were living at a place down on Front Street. She opened her curtains to see the local sheriff, uh, uh, Big John Kirkup, walking across the street with a drunk under each arm carrying them off to the jail. <laughs> so that was her introduction to Revelstoke. Her um, family name was uh, Sarah Banting, and uh, she was a, a double first cousin of Dr. Frederick Banting, the discoverer of insulin. Um, she was a very talented musician. She uh, played the organ and the piano and other instruments, and she provided the uh, piano or organ uh, playing for most of the Protestant denominations in town and played at a lot of the community benefits and concerts as well. Uh, their house was uh, later moved when this uh, site was chosen for the post office. It was just moved over a few blocks onto. Which one is she of the two women? Uh, she is uh, this one. Was, was she Claire, um, I can't remember, Claire's mother? Claire's grandmother. Grandmother. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she was the mother of uh, Benjamin, Earl, and Shella Dickey. Mm -hmm. And uh, Earl was, uh, Earl married uh, Estelle Dickey. And Estelle and Earl were the parents of Claire, who still lives in town. Mm -hmm. uh, all very, very talented. Their daughter, Shella, was a very talented musician as well, and composer. Uh, this is the uh, upper uh, home, and on, it's on, um, close to where the golf course is now. There's a little area there called Upper Place, which is uh, some townhouses. And uh, it's not referring to Upper as an Upper and Lower, it's Upper as in the Upper family, who had a big farm there. Uh, there's uh, Reginald Upper and his wife, uh, uh, Selma, and several of their children. Uh, Selma was born in Sweden in 1879, and she came with her family to Revelstoke in 1885 following the railway construction across Canada. She learned to knit at the age of five, and she was knitting socks to sell to railway workers. <laughs> uh, with her mother and sisters, they ran a confectionery store on Mackenzie Avenue, around where the Taco Club is now. The original building that was on that site, that the, that the uh, uh, Turn, well, Selma's mother was Mrs. Turnross, so the Turnross family owned uh, that building. And it was later moved over to the corner. It uh, became Brandon's Furniture and is now a Pulse uh, boot fit fitting store. Um, they were running a confectionery store at, uh, there, and uh, they also um, had a, a millinery. So the, one of the sisters was uh, really uh, uh, quite skilled in hat making or millinery, so they were selling hats out of the store as well. Um, Selma married Red Jopper in 1902. He died in a tragic hunting accident in 1919, leaving Selma to raise their seven children, aged from an infant up to 16 years. And there's uh, Selma in her later years. Uh, the Corsier family was another early family. Uh, the Henry Noble Corsier had come here in the 1880s and had a general store on Front Street. He married Isabel Corsier from Ontario in 1890 and she came out to join him. She worked as a milliner in the store and uh, was a well-known artist as well. We have one of her paintings in our new Mount Revelstoke exhibit uh, downstairs. And uh, she taught art classes in town as well. Uh, she was very involved in the, the community life she was the first woman on the school board and on the parks board. They had a beautiful home at the south end of Front Street, about where the, the, the big apartment building is, the Rivers Edge apartment building. And um, they, uh, she had a really uh, large garden and uh, flower garden and vegetable garden there. So very active in uh, community life. Uh, their horse's name was Buckskin. We actually have a story about him being attacked and surviving a, an attack by a cougar. And uh, the Corsairs had uh, three sons and uh, two daughters. Um, as I did uh, mention in the last talk, one of their sons died at uh, the age of six when Mrs. Corsair was actually 
where Isabel, of course, she was on Mount Revelstoke when they were building the first chalet up there, and her husband had to walk up to tell her that their son had died. Uh, one of their daughters was Isabel Patricia Corsier, and uh, she became known as the first uh, women's uh, ski jumper and mm -hmm. uh, was uh, the world record holder as a woman's ski jumper uh, for quite a bit of the, the 1920s. Um, there were very few women that were, ju were jumping, and even in recent years, it's been controversial to have women even competing at, at the Olympics. They've had to fight really hard to have women's ski jumping included as a, as a sport, but she was uh, one of the pioneers of, uh, of ski jumping. She also uh, did um, a sport known as ski joring, which was also considered very dangerous for pretty well everybody, where they would uh, ride behind a horse on skis. Uh, but they would have those uh, ski joring competitions on McKenzie Avenue. She was involved in that as well. This Sophie Atkinson, we've also featured here in our Mount Revelstoke exhibit downstairs. She was uh, born in um, England and um, was trained as an artist. She published a book uh, in 1911 called An Artist in Corfu, and we have a copy of that in our exhibit downstairs. Um, she um, was quite a well-known, internationally known artist. Uh, she came, made a couple of trips to Canada. The first one was in the 1920s when she met with Lauren Harris and other members of the, uh, the group of seven. And uh, in the 1940s, she came back to Canada and was uh, traveling across and spent quite a bit of time on Mount Revelstoke and decided that she wanted to live here. So she lived in Revelstoke for quite a few years. And she was the person who started the Revelstoke Art Group back in 1949. So she taught quite a few uh, Revelstoke artists some of the skills that, that she'd learned. And uh, we have quite a few of her paintings in our collection that one? as well. I think, um, yeah, there's at least one or two people in town that, uh, still in town, that took lessons with her. Uh, this is, um, of course, you know, there's all of the um, large uh, Italian community. This is the wedding of uh, Christy, Mr. Christy Baraducci and Caterina Buffero in uh, April uh, 1925. And uh, Caterina had come over from Italy but she was uh, able to learn English fairly quickly, and she became a translator for a lot of the other Italian women who were, were coming to town and really helped a lot of the, the Italian women settle and, and uh, get oriented to their, their new life in Canada. Uh, they helped them fill out documents and paperwork. Um, one of her daughters was uh, uh, Phil Devlin, who just passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, the, one of the really influential families here was the, the Kwong family. Um, this is uh, Mr. Kwong, or Wong Kwong, and his wife was known as Yi Von Kwong. And those are the two older children, Jean and Sam. Uh, they ended up, uh, eventually had 10 children, nine of whom survived to adulthood. And those are other family members. And this was in front of their family laundry, which is uh, close to where the senior center is now. Uh, she came over from uh, China Mary in Kwong. about 1907, and uh, at that time it was uh, there weren't a lot of Chinese women in Canada. A lot of the men found it difficult to bring their wives over because of the head tax and, and other reasons. But uh, she settled here. She had had her feet bound as a child in the Chinese tradition, so she found it very difficult to walk. But even so, she raised her family, worked in the laundry, her husband died in 1932, leaving her with her, her family, the youngest of whom was uh, Jimmy, who's five years old. Jimmy is still alive. And um, they managed to keep the family going. They, she paid off her, her husband's debts. They kept the laundry uh, operating. And they made sure that all of the children got the education that they wanted. Uh, Jimmy told me that they would discuss uh, as a family who was going to go to school and what they were going to take and how they would pay for that. And uh, Jean, who is shown here, uh, went to nursing school and uh, graduated from the Royal Columbian College in, I think, 1936. And she was the first uh, Chinese woman of Chinese ancestry to graduate as a nurse in Canada. So it really broke that barrier. 
Um, her younger sister told me though that um, that Jean was the top student, but they would not give her the prize for top student. They mm -hmm. awarded it to the next woman who was Caucasian. Uh, Mary Kwong, where does she fit in? Mary was the uh, the Mary that we knew in town was the wife of John Kwong, who was one of the one of the the, the one of the children. So okay. uh, these are the two oldest children, and John was one of the oh, so one of the others. One of the ten. Thanks. And this is a woman named uh, Jen Ling, who was the wife of Wing Chun, who was a well-known and uh, local Chinese merchant. And um, she was raised uh, her children here, but uh, she had gone back on a trip to China in 1921. Uh, she suffered from asthma, and she actually died on the boat on the way back. And um, her body was shipped back to Hong Kong for, for burial. Going a little bit fast now because I'm running out of time. These are some of the women of the Women's Canadian Club. It's an organization that started in 1913, and uh, they were their purpose was to bring speakers in to enlighten the women of Revelstoke. But very quickly after they formed, it was 1914, the First World War started. So they spent a lot of their time raising money um, and. Uh, doing fundraising and knitting socks and preparing packages for the, the soldiers overseas. So they put a lot of effort into that over the years. They also had a group that would meet returning soldiers and give them gifts. They would also sell items to passengers on the train to raise money uh, for, the, uh, uh, for their, their war efforts. Um, there's a whole story that I'm not going to have time to get into today. Uh, but around uh, the women's suffrage movement. And a lot of the women of the Women's Canadian Club were very involved in that. We'll save that talk for, for another day, but there was um, one particular woman, uh, Florence Lashley Hall, who was um, very involved both provincially and locally in the suffrage movement. And uh, just really, they, they saw it as a human rights issue because women did not have the rights to their own children and to their own property. And they were very vulnerable in the case of, you know, of uh, divorce or death of their husband. And they, they couldn't even control the lives of their own children. So they saw that as a very important issue. Um, this is Estelle Dickey, who as I mentioned was the, so she was the daughter-in-law of the Sarah Dickey that we looked at, Annette Earl, her husband. And uh, Estelle was, um, it came here in uh, the 1918 and married Earl, and they uh, became really involved in uh, photography and in uh, recording the stories of the pioneers of Revelstoke. We have uh, over 1,500 images uh, taken by Earl and Estelle Dickey, and in the early days, Earl did all the photography, and uh, Estelle did all the darkroom work, and she hand-colored a lot of the, the photographs as well, and became really well known for that. Um, after Earl died in 1954, people were asking her to take photographs, and she didn't think of herself as a photographer, but she took that on after Earl died, and so we've, uh, we've got you know, this huge record of our local history, thanks to, to both of them. I um, also wanted to mention Mary Dame, who was the first curator of mm -hmm. the, the museum, mm -hmm. and um, was um, a really remarkable woman, very funny. Um, and um, also a published author. These are a couple of her children's books that she published, and she also had quite a few uh, poems and short stories in Canadian school readers as well. Uh, there's a scholarship that's named after her, so if you, any of your family members ever get a Mary Dame scholarship, that's who it's uh, honoring. And I also just wanted to mention Ruby Nobbs, who was uh, my mentor here at the museum. Uh, she was born in Revelstoke in 1907 to Jock and Jesse, who were both from uh, Scotland, uh, Rutherford. Um, so she grew up here, uh, became a school teacher. This is her teaching at Sidmouth in the 1920s. <laughs> uh, she married Fred Dowdy Sr., but he died in a railway accident one week before the birth of their eldest son, Fred Dowdy Jr. Um, Ruby worked uh, for her brother Craig in their transfer office. And then uh, he turned that, uh, they turned that into a bowling alley, which uh, Alpine Lane's bowling alley is now the cabin. 
and uh, Ruby managed the bowling alley for many, many years. Uh, so I think anybody who was ever in league bowling back then would have uh, would have known Ruby. And uh, when she finally retired, she became the unpaid manager of the museum and um, was my boss when I started working here in 1983. She continued in that position until 1999. She wanted to see Revelstoke's uh, um, centennial year out. She published her first book in uh, 1998 when she was 91 years old and her second, published, second book, Rail Tales, was published just before she died at the age of 94. So definitely a remarkable woman. Could be quite formidable. Uh, she was involved in a lot of organizations, including the uh, BC uh, Heritage uh, Fe uh, Federation, and uh, was on the, the board of that. They still have a, a, an annual volunteer prize that they give out in her memory. And uh, the, uh, the city councilors would, would always uh, quake in their boots when she came to talk about them, about anything related to heritage or history issues. Um, so, um, but re really very remarkable woman. Um, I just, uh, I've gone over an hour here, so I'm just going to run through a few extra photographs that I have very quickly. Uh, I just put these one in because uh, Mrs. Molson, uh, I believe her name was Martha, was the, her husband was the manager of the local Molson's Bank. And to have a Caucasian woman having her photograph taken with Chinese man was very unusual. So it showed certainly a progressive attitude. Uh, some of the nurses at the Queen Victoria Hospital, they actually had a nursing school there from 1914 to 1935. This is Wilkes, the kindergarten teacher. <laughs> and the women's hockey team in 1903. And I think uh, Don's great aunt or grandmother. This one here. Uh, and the girls' basketball team, 1925 to 1926. And they all have the little cute little bob haircuts. <laughs> and the uh, YMCA girls' fitness class in 1920 with a sign saying, Can we beat the boys? <laughs> Even though they are held up by a boy there. <laughs> And uh, some of the, the uh, three of the sisters of Nels Nelson and Anna Gunnarsson, um, and they were all champion skiers. Mrs. Uh, Gunnarsson was a champion ski racer uh, well into her 40s. So, um, as I say, you know, I could talk about this forever, uh, but I uh, hope you enjoyed the remarkable women that we did talk about. Just want to mention that uh, on Saturday, we're Rosemary Tracy is doing a genealogy workshop uh, here at the museum from 1 to 3 p.m. So if you've always wanted to get started on genealogy but don't know where to start, that's a great place to, to come. You can uh, sign up with us or just or just show up. She'll be prepared to, to help you. So uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you.